From the unsurprisingly plentiful world of Pell pilots comes another Nickelodeon we'll never be. It's 2001 and Micah Wright, writer for iconic Nicktoon The Angry Beavers, has been working on something for a while. If this is approved, it'll be the first action show ever done by Nickelodeon. On March 29, 2001, the pilot is ready to be seen by executives. The show does not get picked up. Decades later, it has made the rounds on the internet and gained a small cult following. The show is constant pain. Small cult following is right, because it seems to be rather known on select corners of the internet. And oh look! With a TV tropes page and everything. It even comes with a list of the three main reasons it was screwed by the network, in their parlance. Saves me a ton of work. Um, oh, okay. Let's just take them not in order. First things first, though. Duh! That's why pilots don't get picked up. If executives like the premise, the show gets greenlit. And even though I've gotten to like it over the past dozen or so rewatches, there's a couple of things that come to mind immediately. Positives first. I love the setting. Sure, it's the future, but the future is not going to be any better or more technological than the present. The cities are bigger and better than ever, but are still just as grimy and polluted as your average 90s alt rock video. The cars fly, but we've gone back to Zeppelins and they're still started with a key. In many ways, it reminds me of the used future as popularized and refined in things like the Ghost in the Shell movies and that reached its zenith with Cowboy Bebop. And the reason I have anime and Cowboy Bebop in my mind probably has something to do with the fact that the intro is a few steps short of a straight ripoff. Not to mention the soundtrack. Which I mean, if you're going to steal from someone, why not steal from the best? So the setting is interesting and the show doesn't waste any time before exploring the mundane aspects of this future through our main character, Amanda Payne. So do you suppose that machine just overlaid a new cheerleader uniform on her? Then we meet her dad, getting another boatload of information in 60 seconds. Amanda Sochi Payne, haven't I asked you not to disturb me when I'm experimenting? Yeah, but I'll be late for school. Fine. You're letting me drive? <laughs> yeah, you wish. Go warm it up. Just like her mother. Good, that's settled. Now we can drive towards the plot. By the way, is it just me, or is the voice acting just a little bit... off? My brother died a long time ago. You're dead to me. Oh, Alex, no, that hurts. Hey, that's Uncle Watton's ship. He's skyjacking that cargo ship. Oh, Dad, wait, what are you doing? Look what happened this time when you drove. Dad, that was Windows not my broken, fault. Doors broken. You're so mean. I love you. I love you too, honey. Here's your lunch. It's just enough for it to be noticeable and somewhat distracting. Like the dialogue needed some extra work or the actors needed another take. Especially since the main voice actors are David Keith and Aspen Miller. If you're almost 14, then that means you're almost old enough to drive. You'll never believe what happened to me on the way to school this morning. Your dad saved the world again? Now I'm not complaining that a pilot needs work. All pilots do. I'm saying that they need to put their best foot for the bunch of executives who don't understand a good show unless it's presented to them as a PowerPoint. They are not going to hear subpar voice acting and come out the other side thinking it'll create positive engagement with our target demographic. Before doing research for this video, the one thing that came out and I saw repeated over and over again was this moment. Please? Yeah, Dad. Great Apparently, this is the moment where Constant Pain stops being a marketable product. I can see why people would believe it. It's perfectly logical. But see, the pilot was finished in late March. I don't know about the inner workings of the television business. I hope I'm not being very optimistic in expecting a decision to take less than six months, especially when you're pitching to the one company. Now granted, after 9-11, priority number one was to change that scene to something less easily associated. But it's likely that the entire thing was going to be reanimated and tweaked anyway. The budget would allow them to bring some more voice actors and the realities of making 44 11 minute shorts forces people to streamline their art styles. The more likely explanation is even more pragmatical. 
for a planet that suddenly needed a lot of healing and was very afraid that someone could try and do something worse, action properties are going to be a hard buy. Those executives I was talking about earlier are not looking at the show, they are looking at all of the potential complaints. Even the name is working against it. Constant pain. What, for the audience? Because that's not a message that you want to have associated with your show. About the only way that I could imagine that title being worse is to make it into something like pain and suffering. Though to be fair, growing pains was basically taken already. Constant pain sounds like an emo MySpace page. It sounds like any number of garage bands that dissolve when one of the members gets a new partner. Yes, this rant is mostly in service of delay in talking about that other point in there. Please give it up for Seema Sargami. Seema Sargami. The woman in charge of Nickelodeon from 1997 to 2018. A tenure that, by sheer length, contains both Nickelodeon's greatest success as well as some of its worst missteps. Micah Wright absolutely cannot stand her, claiming that she killed Constant Pain, saying action shows turn children into terrorists, as well as claiming that she was behind anti-unionization efforts across the company. I don't want to talk about things like this on this channel. This is a fun space. Even if she didn't treat her animation staff like dirt, Sargami's reign over Nickelodeon saw its transformation from weird and exciting animation powerhouse to we have Disney Channel at home, as Nickelodeon rejected what would become one of Disney Channel's biggest animation hits. On the other hand, a couple of years after Constant Pain, two other animators from Nickelodeon Animation Studios pitched an action-adventure show with anime influences, and it went to become one of the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful animated series in history. I don't know about you, but somehow I don't see Constant Pain winning a Peabody. Michael Wright spent the years of the Bush administration using his political science degree and writing skills to create a successful series of remix propaganda books critiquing the Iraq War. He also wrote a Stormwatch comic that got into trouble because it was released on September 13, 2002, and opened with a terrorist attack on the UN. It was cancelled after Wright was found lying about being an army ranger. More recently, he doubled on live action films with the found footage movie They're Watching. If the world had remained stuck in the 90s, Constant Pain would have probably been one of those shows that people who were kids at the time remember fondly, but wouldn't go much further than that. The thing would have probably been greenlit at Kids WB if he had gone to pitch it after Nickelodeon said no. Then we would have seen a little bit more about the pains and what happens when action geniuses and sibling rivalry combine in an action-packed future. Okay.